Welcome to today's APA 7th edition workshop, Tips, Tricks, and Tabs. My name is Carrie Forbes, and I'm the Liaison Librarian for the ECU College of Nursing for the Baccalaureate Program. This presentation will be about an hour. If you have any questions about APA 7th edition after the presentation, please feel free to email me. My email address is forbesc at ecu.edu. Today, we will cover the following about APA 7th edition. Differences in the print edition, online resources that are available to you and your students, new and notable changes to APA, changes to student papers, changes to professional papers, differences in language and grammar in APA 7th, and finally, we will review basic references and in-text citations. Let's look at the print edition of the APA 7th edition manual. It is available in traditional paperback and hardback, along with being available as a spiral bound book with easy to use tabs. And it will also be available as an ebook through two vendors on the APA website. The book will also be available in multiple languages, but they don't have those editions available just yet. There are also expanded student-specific resources, such as many new reference examples that are geared specifically towards nursing students. Finally, there are additional guidelines for ethical and bias-free writing and over 100 new reference examples. Let's look at online resources. Most of these resources are free and available to anyone. Primarily, these resources are available on the APA style website. The two places on the site that are going to be most valuable to you are the instructional aids and the new APA 7th edition style blog, which replaces the old APA 6th edition style blog. The instructional aids include handouts, free tutorials, and webinars, including an academic writer tutorial that you can use for free. It's called the Basics of APA 7th Edition. To use it, click on Start Learning. You'll notice there's a percentage box in the corner that shows how much a student, or you if you're taking this, has completed. Your instructor may ask you to take this quiz and take a screenshot of your completion. Going back to other instructional aids, there are free handouts and guides and they are adding new guides to this site all the time. For example, they just recently added what's new in the publication manual of the APA 7th edition and six steps to proper citation. You can print out these useful guides and use them in addition to the manual. Notice there are also complete sample papers that are available for free. APA 7th edition has guidelines now for both student papers and professional papers. The sample papers are helpful because you can see how to create different types of in-text citations along with examples of multiple types of references. The last thing on the APA site I want to show you is the APA style blog. This is where you will find questions answered and updated information. The blog acts as a supplement to information in the book. APA also has the 7th edition available as an ebook through select vendors. Unfortunately, the library will not be able to have an online version of the book because APA is not making institutional licenses or institutional subscriptions available. Lastly, don't forget that Lopez Library has an APA LibGuide available. The guide shares dozens of examples of references and in-text citations, guidelines for student papers, and tips on APA 7th edition best practices. You can also find a list of APA's free handouts and tutorials, and you can also access a recording of this presentation through the LibGuide. In the next 11 slides, we'll review new and notable changes that have taken place in APA 7th edition, starting with the publisher location. In APA 6, the reference for a book included the location like the city, and the state of the publisher, and then the name of the publisher. In APA 7th edition, the publisher location is no longer included. As you can see in the example, the sixth, in the 6th edition included New York, New York. 
In APA 7th edition, only Simon & Schuster is listed. Another big change, this area of the reference is now called the source and doesn't just include the publisher. For other types of references, it can include the name of a journal and the full link of a DOI, a book publisher, or even a website platform like YouTube, and then may be followed by a full web link of the reference. The next changes to share are shortened in-text citations. In APA 6th edition, for articles with one to five authors, all five needed to be included in the first in-text citation. And for subsequent in-text citations, the first author would be followed with et al. However, in APA 7th edition, for articles with three or more authors, you list the first name and et al. period for all citations, not just the subsequent in-text citations. This shortens the length of in-text citations through the paper, creates consistency within the paper, and is easier to read. Now let's look at 20 plus authors in a reference entry. In APA 6th edition, only up to seven authors were included in a reference entry. In APA 7th edition, up to 20 authors are now included in a reference entry. If a reference has more than 20 authors, you include the first 19 and the very last author. By including more authors in the reference entry, additional researchers will be able to have their names printed in the reference sections on articles they contributed to, even if it was in a small capacity. This allows authors to be more easily found in search engines and databases and gives them more recognition for their work. Another big change is a DOI is listed as a full live website link or hyperlink. DOIs or digital object identifiers are static links or links that will not change over time. These links are useful for resources like journal articles because it gives a researcher a set link where they can always locate an article. In APA 6th edition, DOIs were only included in journal article reference entries and they were labeled as DOI instead of being listed as an actual web link. In APA 7th edition, DOIs are expected to be included in a reference entry for a journal article. And now books are starting to be assigned DOIs as well. When adding a DOI to a reference entry in APA 7th edition, you now want to include the complete DOI web link, which begins with HTTPS colon backslash backslash. The links can also be live hyperlinks when the assignments are turned in electronically or meant to be read online, which is most, if not all, assignments. An important thing to remember is that some journals do not assign DOI links to their articles. When this is the case, you can include the individual website link for the article from the publisher, or simply do not include a link and cite the article as if it were a printed article. For more help finding DOIs for journal articles, please see the Lopez Library's APA 7th edition LibGuide and click on Help, I Can't Find a DOI, which is listed under the journal references. Shortened DOI links are also allowed in APA 7th edition. If you want a shorter link for the end of your citation, you can go to http colon backslash backslash shortdoi.org. Copy and paste the long DOI information or hyperlink into the white space and click Submit. Short DOI will provide you with a shortened link for the full correct hyperlink. Now let's look at website references. Retrieved on and from is usually not necessary in website references in APA 7th edition. In APA 6th edition, website references included the phrase retrieved from before adding the web link. References also commonly included the retrieval date. In APA 7th edition, these phrases are generally no longer necessary since it is understood that by clicking on the shared web link, a reader or researcher can find the reference materials. 
There are several changes in the layout of web pages for APA 7th edition as well. The title of the web page is now italicized. It was not in APA 6th edition. The source or area where the publisher is listed for books and journals now includes the website name or platform followed by a period. And then the full live hyperlink is added. In the example shared here, BBC News is the name of the publisher or the overall website. So it is listed followed by a period followed by the complete web page. The only time you need to reuse to use retrieved from comma date in APA 7th edition is when you are citing from sources that share content that is updated frequently and old editions of the page are not saved or archived. An example would be if you are citing an article from Wikipedia or citing a definition of a word from an online dictionary like merriamwebster.com. Another important change for website references is like DOIs, shortened web links can be used. There are many free services to do this, such as tinyurl.com and tiny.cc. Just make sure that if you use shortened links to double check that they work correctly before submitting your work. One space after a period. In APA 6, two spaces were recommended, but now only one space is required. More new and notable changes include chapters on bias-free language, along with updated grammar and writing guidelines. One example of a new change in APA 7th edition for bias-free language is the acceptance of the gender-neutral description they as a singular pronoun. In the past, he or she was the preferred language which was not inclusive of individuals who do not identify as female or male. They is also helpful as a description, such as they went to the store. It does not denote gender or any preconceived notions of why the person may have gone to the store. It can be a very useful way to reduce gender bias in writing. We'll discuss these changes in detail in a few minutes. Another noticeable change is the student paper running head. In APA 6th edition, there were not separate guidelines for writing a student paper. The professional example shared included a running head, which is useful for publishers when they are styling a paper for publication. In APA 7th edition, student papers no longer have a running head or a header. They only have a page number placed flush right. APA 7th also has specific guidance on the information to share on a student title page. We'll share that in a few minutes. Let's move on to paper layouts and heading levels. APA is very specific about the heading levels in a paper. Heading levels can be things like the introduction, the method session, the discussion, etc. Page 48 in the seventh edition manual can help you better understand how to format each heading level in your paper. APA also has several free full sample papers on their website that can help you understand each section of your paper and how to properly format it. Now let's look at additional fonts. So this is exciting if you're not a fan of Times New Roman. I have to admit, I'm kind of old school and I like Times New Roman. But APA has recognized that there are several additional fonts that offer easy readability and have the flexibility to share Roman numerals and other symbols that Times New Roman makes available. The fonts now accepted are Calibri 11 point, Arial 11 point, Lucida Sans Unicode 10 point, and Georgia 10 point. Sadly, Comic Sans is still no longer accepted. However, I have read that using Comic Sans can help you with writer's block and just getting started in writing your paper. Some people have shared that using Comic Sans helps them create sentences that flow better and sound better. So if you have trouble in the first writing phase of your paper, Comic Sans might help. Lastly, in our new and notable changes section, 
APA 7th edition gives us a little more help when it comes to finding the right information for the author section of media resources. Do you cite the director of the movie or a producer? Do you cite the host of the podcast or the writer? Well, this helpful table in APA 7th edition lays out clearly who should be cited in each of these instances, which makes it much easier to create a citation for a media resource. Now let's look at how student papers are laid out in APA 7th edition. Student papers no longer use a running head. The only thing necessary on all pages is the page number, which is flush right. Papers should have a one inch border on all sides and are double spaced throughout. APA lays out an exact formula for the student title page. In the upper middle of the paper, about three to four lines down, you start with the student name centered. The next line is the department, such as College of Nursing, comma, East Carolina University. Then the course number and title, the instructor's name, and lastly, the due date of the assignment. Student papers do not contain an abstract or keyword. If instructors want their students to include a page with the abstract and keywords, it needs to be clarified on the syllabus or assignment. Section headers are either bold or bold and italicized, depending on the levels of heading. Now let's look at professional papers. These papers do have a running head. However, you don't need the actual text running head. So therefore, all of your pages have the same header. Pages will also include the page number flush right. Again, like student papers, APA is very clear on the formula for what belongs on the title page. The title of the paper is in bold, followed by the author's names and then in the order of the authors the departments and colleges they are affiliated with. Note the superscript of the authors one, two, and three, and the accompanying superscript below with the author's affiliation. Lastly, under author note at the bottom of the page, authors can include their ORCID ID. Any changes of affiliation, if you were at another institution previously, and any disclosures and acknowledgments. Do you know what an ORCID ID is? It's like having your own personal DOI, which can keep track of all of your professional publications and follow you along your career path. They are easy to use and your librarian will be happy to help you set one up. The following pages on a professional paper and header have not really changed. The major change is that the tables and figures can now be located within the text of the paper and do not have to be added after the text in the appendix. Let's move on to differences and language in APA 7th edition. We could actually do an entire class just on these changes. So I am just going to briefly review a few of them. One thing I appreciate about this manual is that it's very easy to read and understand. And I believe you and your fellow students will learn from the writing chapters as well as the in-text citations and reference chapters. Chapters that may be beneficial specifically for instructors and graduate students who want to publish are the full chapter on Journal Article Reporting Standards, or JARS, which is Chapter 3, Chapter 9, Guidelines for Legal References, and Chapter 12, An Overview of the Publication Process. Chapters that may be highly beneficial for undergraduate students are Chapter 4, which covers writing style and grammar, including verbs, pronouns, sentence structure, clarity and conciseness in writing. Chapter one, which is a good primer on scholarly writing and types of research. Chapter six, which covers the mechanics of style. And chapter five, which is a fantastic chapter on learning how to write in a professional way that decreases bias towards subjects in research. Speaking of chapter five, let's review the guidelines for reducing bias. I am very happy to see that these changes were shared by APA, and I think you will be too. We always want to strive to be better allies to our friends who identify as LGBTQIA+, or fall into a diverse, underserved, or minority population 
and these guidelines will help us all to be better advocates for inclusion. APA felt it was critical for the seventh edition to offer these guidelines to help writers give fair, unprejudicial treatment to the groups or groups that they are writing about. They wanted to make changes that acknowledge inclusion and diversity for all participants in research and the writers themselves. Some examples of this include being sensitive not to label a person as a disease or a problem. For example, instead of saying the learning disabled or schizophrenics, use nouns with descriptive phrases such as people who are diagnosed with schizophrenia or a person with learning disabilities. APA also wants to acknowledge and recognize racial and ethnic groups as proper nouns. For example, in North America, the collective terms Native American and Native North American are acceptable and are often preferred to our American Indian. Remember that Indian usually refers to people from India. Also, if you can specify the nation or people a group or person identifies with, it gives even more inclusion and acceptance. Such as in North Carolina, a person could be a member of the Lumbee, the Halawasaponi, or the Meharan. Like in our previous slide, we're talking about using descriptive phrases instead of labels for bias reduction. Instead of saying the poor as a generalized group of people, try using a specific income range, such as those who have a household of less than $20,000. The same can be said for ages. Instead of referring to old people or the elderly, you could say for people between the ages of 75 and 85. And finally, let's look at terms for sexual orientation and gender. Be aware that definitions of sexual orientation are evolving. Right now, if you are referring to multiple sexual and or gender minority groups, you can use the terminology sexual and gender minorities. If you are not already aware, the term LGBT is outdated terminology. And currently there is not a general consensus on the correct term to use, but there are other more inclusive abbreviations such as LGBTQIA, LGBTQ+, etc. You can also visit websites like glad.org or the Safe Zone Project to learn more about currently accepted terminology and definitions. Remember, what we're really trying to do is be accepting and welcoming of all people. And when we use identity first language, we're acknowledging a person's whole self, not just labeling them with one characteristic or attribute. So now let's move on to reference entries and how to cite sources in APA 7th edition. You can think of references as split into four categories. And the categories are in this order, and you're already familiar with them. Author, who created or wrote the work. Date the year or date the work was published, the title, what the work is called, and the source. The source used to be called the publisher, but since references are now published through a variety of different mediums, source, or where the work can be found or retrieved, makes more sense. Let's look at a visual that demonstrates how each part is used in the reference. This is my favorite visual APA chart. This is the seventh edition quick reference guide. I love this chart because it breaks down the reference into easy components. I actually have this chart printed, cut out, and taped to my computer, so I can quickly glance and remember exactly where each part of a reference is located. You can find this free chart on the APA site or through our Lopez Library APA 7th Edition LibGuide. So how do you find the reference elements in a journal article? In a PDF, you can usually find all of the reference elements you need on the first page of the article. The title is usually centered and in bold text. The authors are generally listed underneath the title. And make sure to always leave the authors in the order they have been written in the journal. They are listed from primary author to secondary author and so on. The journal name is usually listed in an upper corner or across the top. The full article page numbers are usually listed under the issue and volume number and often in a corner, either at the top or bottom of the page. And the DOI is often shared somewhere near the volume and issue number. 
Let's look at creating a reference for a journal article with a DOI. The primary difference between APA 6 and APA 7 is the addition of the DOI as a full live web link. As you can see in the chart under source, it is also acceptable to use a publisher's website for an article if they do not assign DOIs. If the publisher does not assign DOIs or have an individual web page for a journal, Cite the journal as if it were a print journal with no website link. Otherwise, journal articles are basically cited the same way they were in APA 6th edition. One last thing to note on this slide, the APA 7th edition reference examples show you exactly how you would write an in-text citation for that reference. This is a big help and an improvement from the 6th edition. Now let's turn to an article with 21 or more authors. In APA 6th edition, only seven authors were included in a reference entry for journal articles with seven plus authors. In APA 7th edition, for articles with more than 20 authors, the first 19 authors are listed and then the very last author is listed for a total of 20 authors in the reference entry. This example shows us how you can use a shortened DOI in the reference entry. You'll also notice the use of a shortened in-text citation with this example. From the very first in-text citation, you start with Calne et al. period, comma, 1996, instead of including five authors as was done in sixth edition. Let's move on to a journal article that is an online advanced publication. So what is an advanced online publication? This is when a publisher releases an article on their website before the actual volume of the journal is published. Articles are often shared early if the research is on an ongoing or emerging medical topic such as COVID-19. This way readers have access to evidence-based research sooner than waiting for the entire volume to be published. If the article is listed as in press, it most likely is not yet available to read online or in the journal. You may have received a copy from the author to review. For these articles, cite them as if they are from a print journal by leaving off a web link. When you're citing an online advanced publication, the major difference from a regular journal article is in the place of the volume and issue. You add online advanced publication instead. Advanced online publications usually have their own DOI. So let's say you've been researching your topic for several months, and when you first started researching, several of your articles were advanced online publications. Now, several months later, you notice when you're working on your references that the articles are now also listed as fully published with a volume and an issue number. So which version of the article do you cite? You always want to cite the version that you used when you wrote the paper. There are often slight changes between the advanced online publication and the fully edited article in the published volume. Therefore, you want to make sure your reader understands the actual version that you use. So now what about books with a DOI? Some newer books are starting to be assigned a DOI on publication. If a book has a DOI, it is usually located on the copyright page of the book. If you look at the copyright page of the APA 7th edition, the DOI is located on the bottom left as a complete web link. If a book has this information, you list it right after the publisher on the reference entry. Kindle books, audiobooks, or ebooks that are not in an academic research database should have the web link of the publisher's page for the book if they do not have a DOI. Ebooks no longer need to be designated as an ebook in the reference entry. However, if the book is an audiobook, you do need to place the word audiobook in brackets after the title. Also note that if you're directly quoting from an audiobook, you would cite the minute and second after the date in the in text citation instead of a page number. Now let's consider books from academic research databases or print versions. One of the nice things about APA 7th edition is that the APA decided they wanted more consistency in book reference entries. They wanted to make books from research databases easier to cite. 
So they are cited exactly like print books, even though they are technically ebooks. The main difference from APA 6 is that we no longer include the location of the publisher in the reference entry. Print books and ebooks from academic research databases do not need a website or DOI web link added to the reference entry if one is not provided in the book. You will notice the terms author books and edited books in APA 7th edition. Authored books are simply books that are written by one author. They are edited, but the editor is not given authorship and is usually not listed in the book. Edited books, however, are usually larger textbooks and reference guides that may have dozens of chapters with many different authors. One last thing to note is to make sure that when you're looking at a book from an academic research database to look inside the book for the copyright date. The academic research database page may not have the correct date listed. How about citing a chapter from an edited book? For the most part, a reference entry for a book chapter is the same as it was for APA 6th edition. One question I get frequently asked is, when should I cite a chapter of a book instead of a whole book? A good rule of thumb for this question is, if the book just has one author, which you remember is considered an authored book, you want to cite the entire book. It's more important to cite a chapter of a book when you are citing from an edited book with lots of chapters that are generally written by different people. This gives the chapter author the opportunity to get recognition for their individual work since editors are listed in the place of an author for edited books. In chapter reference entries, the title of the chapter is listed in the title area, and the source states that the editor or editor's name, followed by ed period in parentheses, then followed by the title of the book in italics with page numbers in parentheses, followed by the publisher name. Lastly, if your book has a DOI web link or publisher page, that is shared live. Let's look at online dictionaries and encyclopedias. In the examples here, notice the first two examples share a retrieval date. This is because online dictionaries like Merriam-Webster and encyclopedias like Wikipedia update their sites frequently and do not archive old material. When you are citing from a source like this, you want to make sure your reader understands that the information on the pages now may be different than the information that was shared when you did your research. This is why it's important to share the retrieval date on those sources. It's also a good reminder that Wikipedia and many other online encyclopedias are not actually peer-reviewed scholarly sources. So make sure if you're using material from these sites, it is secondary to your scholarly and peer-reviewed materials. Another thing to notice on the first two examples of this slide is the date is listed as in period D period. This is because the information or entries on these pages are not given an actual copyright date as the information changes. When that happens, you list no date or in period D period as the date. Finally, when the publisher of a source is the same as the author, for instance, in the second example, Merriam-Webster is both the author, the publisher, and the name of the website. When this is the case, you do not need to list the publisher in the source. This is the same for books as well. For instance, if you are creating a reference citation for the APA 7th edition manual, you would list the American Psychological Association as the author and not list the publisher. So how do we cite social media sources? Overall, social media sources follow the same layout as a journal and book reference entry. However, there are several key differences. The title, for any type of social media, you create the title of the reference entry by using up to the first 20 words of text or description of the information. So in the second example, the author used the first 20 words in the infographic to create the title. It's also important to note that in APA 7th edition, website titles, even from social media, are italicized. In social media references, the type of information or media is explained in brackets. In the first example, this is a reference entry for an image in a Facebook status update from Neil Gaiman. At the end of the title, the actual piece of information being referenced is listed in brackets. 
So in this example, an image attachment and status update is being cited. If you were in Twitter, you would cite a tweet at the end of a title. If you were citing from YouTube, you would say video after the title. A main website, also called a platform or a parent organization, is cited in the source as well. After the type of information is listed in brackets, the main website or platform is listed in the source area. And this is where you would normally put a journal name or book publisher. So in social media, you might list Facebook or Twitter or even YouTube. Lastly, link shorteners such as bit.ly or tinyurl or tiny.cc are all accepted in APA 7th edition if you don't want to copy and paste a really long website into your reference entry. Just make sure to double check that shortened link and make sure it's working so that your reader or instructor can access the information that you're referencing. So citing general websites is very similar to citing social media. We follow the same guidelines regarding the title of the entry, which is listed in italics, and the main website or platform, which is listed after the title. The date in the website, especially on news sites, blogs, and forums, is usually listed in the year, month, and day. So we use that information in the date area. If it only has a year, just use that. If there's no date listed on the website, you would use N period, D period as the date. It's important to remember that if you are sharing a direct citation from a website to list the in-text citation as the author, the date, and then the paragraph number or section. So for example, if we were using the second example in this slide, you would say Bologna, comma, 2018, comma, para.4, or Bologna, comma, 2018, comma, how do we treat it, section. So what happens if you need to create a reference entry, but you're missing a piece of information? Page 284 in the APA 7th edition manual offers a great table that will help you create a reference when you're missing information. For instance, the general rule of thumb if you're missing an author is to use the title in place of the author and complete the citation with the remaining information. Just remember, if you ever get stuck trying to figure out a citation, just send me an email. I'm more than happy to help you. Since APA 7th edition manual shares in-text citation examples throughout the text, it makes it much easier to understand how to create one. However, there are a few basic rules. In APA 6, it was the rule to cite up to five authors in your first in-text citation of a source. This rule often made it tricky to figure out how to do your first citation versus your second or third citation. In APA 7th edition, you list up to two authors in a citation. If a reference has three plus authors, you list the first author and then follow with et al. So you might have one author listed or two authors listed if only two authors wrote the article. But if you have three or more, you only list the first author and et al. Not just for the first entry, but for all entries for that work. So what about direct quotes? For the most part, direct quotes are shared the same way they were shared in APA 6. They follow the three plus authors guidance that was shared in the last slide along with the page number. If you're sharing a direct quote from an online source that does not include page numbers, Remember, you can use the paragraph location or the section of the quote. Short quotes are less than 40 words, and they need to be placed in quotation marks and then followed by the citation with the paragraph, the page, or section number. Long quotes are 40 words or more and are shared as a block quote. They do not have quotations and are made by indenting the line 0.5 inches or one tab. So congratulations. You've made it through an hour of listening to me talk about APA 7th edition. I know this isn't the most exciting topic, but I found that learning to use APA can actually improve your writing skills and help you learn how to share information in a more professional way. It's a useful skill to learn and it can help you in the future when you're writing cover letters for jobs, writing a report for a future boss, charting notes on patients from a hospital floor, 
or even help you learn how to be a better researcher if you choose to further your education. Thank you so much for joining me today, and please feel free to reach out to me if you need help using APA in your assignments. My email address is forbesc at ecu.edu. I hope you have a wonderful day and that you feel a little bit more confident about using APA in the future.